Hello everybody, this is Michael Haupt and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the next session in our Opus Economy Telesummit. And today we're in conversation with Tracy Webster. But before I introduce Tracy, I encourage you to add your voice to the conversation. If you're watching live, you can participate by adding your questions, comments and thoughts into the chat box on the right hand side just underneath the big red box. And if you're watching this as a recording, there's a link underneath this video that will take you to our forum where you can leave questions uh, for our speakers to, to answer at a later stage. Um, <clears throat> so it's my great pleasure to introduce Tracy Webster, who is the Executive Director at the African Leadership Institute. Tracy, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, and I'm delighted to be able to join everyone out there um, and to share some of the insights that I've experienced over the last couple of years in leadership. I'm looking forward to this. So Tracy currently holds the position, as we said, of Executive Director at the African Leadership Institute. But prior to that, Tracy was the Chief Entrepreneurship Officer, the CEO at the Branson Center of Entrepreneurship, uh, which is part of the Virgin Unite initiative. Tracy has worked as an independent social development consultant on leadership and social change issues. And here to lead the conversation with Tracy is the founder and CEO of Proudly for Purpose, Magna Rotenbach. Thank you, Michael. And um, Michael is my co-host for the Delhi Summit. He's the CEO and founder of The Brain Barn, um, which provides visibility, impact, and business services for thought leaders. Thanks, Michael, for uh, being a part of this. And Tracy, thank you for taking the time to explore with us a topic central to the positioning of Africa in a changing world, building purposeful, visionary, and strategic leadership across Africa. Thank you for hosting me. Tracy, almost all of your professional life to date was dedicated to leadership development. Tell us about uh, this incredible journey. Well, Magna, I think um, all journeys actually do begin with yourself. And so if I have to reflect um, how I landed in, into this position and, and many positions over the last couple of years, I think I realized quite early on, and certainly at school, I was in positions of leadership. And what I truly believe that is leadership is actually a talent. It's, it's a God-given gift. Um, and as any other talent, whether you're an athlete or uh, you're talented in business, whatever your talent is, I think everyone will agree that you have to work really hard at that. You have to develop the tools to become exceptional at that. You have to self-reflect and um, really hone the talent that you've been given. And certainly over my life, I've, I've been in positions of leadership. Um, and I'm a true believer in learning through experience. So hopefully what I'm going to share with you all today is, is, is some of those experiences I've gleaned along the way. But one thing I would say about leadership is that as a leader, you have a real responsibility because you're responsible to your followers. And I think it's up to the leader to be able to create platforms for the people that you work with or the people that you're leading for them to excel for them to really understand and unpack their gifts so that they can go on to live into the fullness of who they were created to be. And I think that's the joy that I've had is, is watching people grow and expand um, in the teams that I've worked with or, for example, at the Branson Center of Entrepreneurship, working with these incredible young, um, feisty entrepreneurs and, and just reiterating that they're actually leaders of their companies, that there's a whole... Uh, following of people, uh, little eyes and communities that are looking up to these new business leaders in South Africa and and just reinforcing that as a leader you have to be a role model as well. You have to develop a moral compass and watching people grow um, and develop is, is just a real gift. So I've been very privileged to be able to witness that uh, throughout the organizations that I've led. And Tracy, um, obviously strong leadership is, as elsewhere in the world, extremely important in the African context. Uh, but how can it contribute to the transformation of Africa? 
I'm glad that you, you brought that up. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be a part of a network called the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Fellows, which is uh, young leaders across um, the continent. And every year we gather together alongside the Mo Ibrahim Conference. Uh, last year it was in Addis Ababa um, when the African Union was celebrating 50 years. And I want to share with you a quote uh, from Jay Naidu. We were lucky enough as a group of Tutu Fellows to have a a very intimate uh, conversation with him about the future of Africa. Now, Jay Naidu um, is the founding general secretary of Kisatu, as well as the former minister in the Mandela government. And he had this to say, our lives are littered with the broken promises of leaders. Our current leaders are out of touch. We are the richest continent under the ground, but we are the poorest in the world. It's time for leadership and governance. It's time the older generation moved out of the way. Now is our time, and we need a plan. We need implementation, and we need our citizens to be at the center of development. And I think he really sums up the importance of visionary and strategic and moral, cohesive leadership that's required. Because at the end of the day, Africa, at the, at the, the point that we're in, in terms of really you know, pushing ahead to, to transform ourselves, to become a global player, uh, we've got huge challenges to overcome. Let's not kid ourselves, you know. We've got issues around governance, water, sanitation, education, health, energy, infrastructure, gender equality, trade and investment. And what's required in order for us to overcome those challenges um, is, is strong leadership. Um, and it needs to be ethical, and it needs to be across all levels of success, of uh, all sectors of society. So I'm a big fan that that Africa's leaders are going to drive the transformation of Africa. And uh, and if we talk about the transformation of Africa, um, what would the ideal picture be? Well, I'm a I'm a big visionary person, so. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think creating a vision and, and um, really allowing ourselves to dream is, is really critical as, as a continent so that we have a consolidated view around what we're wanting to see. But I would love to see us over the next 10, 15 years see just solid governance in place across the continent that ruling parties are adhering to. Uh, you know, and perhaps as we start leading through our diversity and all of these complexities and, and huge challenges, as we overcome that, I have no doubt that we are actually going to give birth to a new political ideology and, and really start looking at merging the strengths of capitalism and socialism. And, and I wouldn't be surprised as, if Africa births something new on that front. Um, I'd love to just see stable and, and consistently growing economies, um, policies that are put in place really to ensure that there's strong inter-Africa trade and intercontinental um, trade. It would be great to see the development of um, more pan-African corporate giants um, playing in the global market space. Uh, and then just an emergence of a fresh, um, strong cultural identity. I think we are made up of so many different ethnic groups and cultures that are also rich and vibrant. But I'd love to see something emerge um, that marries all of that together, that really unites all of us together as Africans. Um, I have no doubt that um, Africa will be a trendsetter in food, fashion, architecture, film, dance, and the fine arts, um, and, and that we, we just have an ability to be able to pioneer the way forward um, and tackle big issues. And I think the way in which we're harnessing technology to overcome some of those issues such as health, education, entrepreneurship development is, is, is pretty profound. Um, I think we, we're poised to create and, and see the birth of new and many, many more Nobel, um, Nobel Peace Prize winners. Um, and then um, I think ultimately what we really need to strive for is to be completely and utterly self-sufficient. I, I think that's critical, that we, that we can really stand on a, on a global platform and, and play as any other um, part of the world. Um, I think we're poised for miraculous strides in a very short period of time. Um, and ultimately, we could be exporting some of the so solutions uh, that we come up with, with that tackle social issues that are relevant on a global platform. Uh, so really, just to, to sum it up, uh, I thought I'd just share with you a poem um, that I think encapsulates a, a really bright vision for Africa. It was 
written by Gabenga um, Suzan, uh, he's Nigerian and he's an Archbishop Tutu Fellow, and when he was asked to encapsulate a vision for Africa, he had this to say, Light has become day, and the tears have dried up. Our sons and daughters are within the walls of our glory. The richness of our culture becomes the light that others seek. Those who have called us dark have come to meet our light. Africa shows the way. And I think that just really encapsulates all that we, we can become. Tracy is a phenomenal poem, and, and the insight shared there is just great. Um, now, if we look at the African Leadership Institute, that uh, really exists to build capacity and visionary leadership. Uh, won't you give us a glimpse of what this visionary, strategic, and innovative leadership entails? What are you busy with on a day-to-day -day basis? So I think the African Leadership Institute has realized that there's um, the time that we're in, um, in in Africa requires this type of leadership really to bring about the transformation of our continent. Um, we have a lot of um, challenges that we have to overcome and I think being innovative and being strategic and working together as leaders from across the continent is what's really going to bring about the transformation. Um, and so they have a real talent at working across the continent and really identifying those young leaders under the age of 40 that have already shown enormous potential in the work that they're doing, but bringing them together collectively to start developing um, Africa uh, solutions for the challenges that we face. I'll just give you one quick example of, of some, you know, the types of Tutu Fellows um, that are in the program, but there's a young man uh, called Eric Tyrus who's based in Mozambique. Um, he's an exceptional young man. Uh, he really was concerned about um, upholding uh, democracy in his country and what he decided to do was to create an advocacy platform um, and, and a space where uh, ordinary citizens can take part in, in building uh, their country and the way he did that was through launching the first ever free newspaper called Verdad, which means the truth. Um, now most people in Mozambique are never going to be able to afford to buy a newspaper because it's more important to put um, a loaf of bread on the table. So most people don't engage in reading. And what he has done, I, I was lucky enough to go out um, on one of the deliveries. He has these little tuk-tuks that just um, drive around Mozambique on the day the paper gets released um, and just hands it out to people. And just the, the passion and the way in which people just grabbed a hold of these papers and just passed it on family after family was amazing. But through that, he's able to educate the population around um, what's happening uh, you know, from a governance perspective, um, educating people around the right to vote, et cetera, et cetera, um, and to see more and more people engaged in debates, um, talking about the politicians, voting for politicians, talking about values in their society. And I think that's a very ingenious way of, 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 of galvanizing um, everyone to, to engage um, in, in, in civil society. Uh, but also what I loved about Eric, what, what came out of those papers was a real frustration with the youth, um, especially uh, professional youth actually leaving Mozambique to come down south to, uh, because they're not able to buy houses or property or land in Maputo because it's so expensive. And um, he took that on board, lobbied the government um, and the banks and came up and has actually developed the first ever um, housing um, complex type of state something like you see in Johannesburg, where young people are able to buy affordable housing. That's never been done in Mozambique before. Um, but he's just coming up, listening to what's happening on the ground, listening to his followers, and then coming up with innovative partnerships in order to create opportunities for people in his country. That just gives you an idea of the, the type of people that we get to see every day across the continent. And Tracy, you now heading up the uh, leadership fellow uh, leadership fellowship program, and um, what what does uh, that consist of? Tell us a bit more about this exciting program. So, so the African Leadership Initiative has its flagship program being the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Leadership Fellowship, um, and it's a highly prestigious award that gets awarded to. 20 young Africans um, across the continent, it's a nominations only process. 
And basically what they do is they gather them together every year in a six-month uh, program. You start out at Mount Fleur in Stellenbosch where our South African constitution was written um, in 94. Um, and so it's just steeped in history. And basically what it does is it brings you together as young leaders from different sectors and obviously cultures, religious groupings, the diversity is extraordinary. And you really begin to, to grapple with some of the big issues in Africa. You learn to scenario plan, you learn to develop visions, a, a vision for the continent, um, and to start getting to know each other. Um, and and it's, it's, it's interesting how diverse we are. It shifts your perspective um, and, and shapes you in a way that I've, I've never experienced before. And then more than that, you work in syndicate groups uh, with different people from across the continent to develop scenarios for Africa 2020, uh, to work on uh, big issues that our continent faces, be it education, entrepreneurship, whatever it is. Uh, and you have to project plan around that. And you go to the last phase of your fellowship, which is um, in conjunction with the Oxford Side Business School, where you get to uh, present the outcomes of your findings on the projects that you've been working. And then again, to go through a very reflective time, um, personal reflection um, uh, in terms of your leadership style and very hands-on practical tools that you learn. So it's, it's an amazing um, it's an amazing organization. And, and now the next step is really harnessing the 200 Tutu Fellows across the continent and their various uh, spheres of influence um, to tackle big projects um, to see the rise of Africa. And of course, Tracy, uh, um, one of the major role uh, models in Africa, uh, the Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu is the um, patron of the Institute. Um, quite a phenomenal man um, in, at so many levels. Um, but can you share a bit, because you're working closely with him, share a bit of his philosophy about leadership? He's an extraordinary individual, and I think one of the things that makes him so extraordinary is he walks the talk. Um, and I'm just going to share with you a quote. Um, he, every group of Tutu Fellows that comes together in Stellenbosch has the opportunity um, to meet him, and, and he usually stands up and gives an amazing address, if not a challenge, that he throws out to all of us as leaders. I'm just going to take a snippet um, out of his address to us, but he, he says this. I want you to stand up against the evils that may pervade your society, be they corruption, greed, discrimination, intolerance, abuse, or whatever. But I also want you to be the positive creators of opportunities for others to share the benefits of success and endeavor. Empowering and enabling others to succeed is as important and rewarding as fighting inequalities. Caring, humility, vision, and passion are hallmarks of great leaders. I look to you to be the generation that drives the transformation of Africa. And I particularly look to the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Fellows to be at the forefront of change. You know, when you, you receive an address from a man like that, um, and you know that his philosophy is, is, is based on action, um, that he has really modeled out that philosophy and all that he has done in his leadership role. Um, and the, the challenge really lies for all of us to inculcate that philosophy into our own leadership styles and to enact that out on a daily basis. And I think if all people um, in, in leadership positions could reflect on that quote and, and see how they can inculcate that into their daily lives, um, I, think, I think the world would be better off, quite frankly. We need more to do's. Definitely so, uh, Tracy, and um, we both feel strongly that values is of paramount importance in building all facets of African life, whether it be business, government, or personal life. Um, what is the moral compass um, that we are trying to nurture in our action as leaders? Uh, what role does values play in the fellowship program and what are the values underpinning the network of young leaders? How do you find young leaders' uptake of values in the current day? I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I think moral 
uh, leadership is actually absolutely key um, in order for this country or this this continent to succeed and that's something we take very strongly and very seriously um, at the African Leadership Institute in fact a lot of what you inculcate over that fellowship is uh, being encouraged to take time to really distill your moral compass it's absolutely key the reality is is if you are in a position of leadership your morals are going to be challenged all the time. You are going to find yourself in situations um, where you are going to be tempted. Temptation is everywhere, wherever you look. Um, and if you don't solidify upfront what your compass is, what your no, when your no is no, what is that line? Um, and it's very easy for you, if you haven't done that, to start on the slippery slope down. And I'll give you one example in one of the um, applications that I was reading by a Tutu Fellow. I loved their honesty around saying I was doing a business deal in Africa. I had amazing US investors. The deal was going to get done. It was huge. Our company was going to fly. And then suddenly, in this one particular country uh, in Africa, they were asking um, to, to engage in, 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 in bribing and, and corruption and all the rest of it. And, you know, at the greater scheme of things, when he looked at it, he thought, you know, it's just a little payoff. And, and if I look at the, the greater scheme of things, you know, amazing things are going to happen for this just one little payoff. Um, but then he realized, actually, if I start on that road, I will never stop. And there is no such thing as just this once. Um, and I love that reflection. And at the end of the day, he pulled out of the deal. Um, his company is still thriving. He did deals elsewhere. Um, and, and he's got his moral compass and his values intact. Um, the other thing, what's surprising, is if you hold true and, and, you, and to, your, to your moral compass and to your values, surprising things can happen if you hold true to it. One uh, young Tutu fellow, uh, Susan Mashiba, um, um, has her own aviation company. She um, flies um, uh, small uh, jets around the continent and, and globally for ministers and, and, and various different dignitaries around the world. Um, and often they, on, on the flight path to the US, you have to refuel in Dakar. Um, and at one point, she was asked to actually bribe uh, the officials there in order to refuel. And she said no. And they kind of forced her down the line saying, you don't really have a choice. <laughs> there's, there's nowhere else you're going to be able to stop and fill up your planes with petrol. You kind of have to do this. Um, but she has a very strong moral compass. And she said, I will find a way around this, but I will not engage in corrupt behavior. And, um, and what she did is she actually started and opened up her own business in Dakar. Um, she has her own team of people working on the ground um, and has actually created employment in that particular country. And so I love the fact that something innovative came out of her boldness around holding a strong moral compass. And what I'm seeing, certainly amongst the Tutu Fellows, is that it's a non-negotiable for us. Um, and, and, and the more we hone in and, and articulate what those morals are, um, the easier it is for all of us to hold each other accountable to it. And, and just one final point, it's wherever you are, whether you the head of your household, whether you're mother or father and there are little people around you that are looking up to you, you are an acting and role modeling out for them values and you have to take that very seriously. We learn our values from our families and I think it's good for families to sit down as a family and go, what are our values as a family? And to actually have a very open conversation around values and our morals um, in conjunction as families. I know families that do it, and it's, it's wonderful to see children engaging in those kinds of conversations. So I think it's valuable for every single person in society to really create that compass. And the younger, of course, the, um, the uptake of accountability, the better. But uh, Tracy, tell me, you were selected as a Tutu Fellow in 2007. Now that must, must have been um, a, a very unique experience with a lot of learnings coming fr from it. Uh, share some of those. Yeah, it was just an unbelievable blessing to, to, to be selected and to be a part of this, this young, amazing group of, of, of young leaders across the continent. Um, it really opened my eyes quite radically, I must say. Um, up until then, I'd only had experience working in South Africa. And uh, my Nigerian counterparts quickly told me that um, 
I needed to broaden my vision. It was far too small. At that point, I was working for Starfish and was supporting 22,000 orphan and vulnerable children. And I was thinking we were, you know, really getting to the numbers. And they assured me that with 50 million potential orphans in Africa, we weren't even hitting a dent. Um, and also, um, just this, this this concept that I found quite interesting that I learned is, is, is they just reflected back to us as young leaders, as South Africans, that we're so engrossed in this race thing. And they were like, guys, lift up your eyes, get up, get over it, and go forward. Because the greater issue that this continent faces is actually ethnicity. And they were just kind of putting into context, if you look at how many millions of people are in Africa, and what percentage are the white population, it's, it's not an issue that we need to get stuck on. Um, and we're kind of navel-gazing over this issue that we always somehow get stuck on um, in, as South Africans. And none of us, and they kept saying to us, something worse is coming your way. And um, the xenophobic phobic attack, attacks happened several years later. Well, none of us had seen that coming. And it was only then, in hindsight, that I, I realized and understood what they were talking about around our, our ethnicity divide and, and how we've actually got to work hard to overcome that. Um, and then another a pearl of wisdom that, that has stood me in such good stead forever, um, Sean Lance, actually the founder of the Institute, said this. He said, um, always be emotional about the past. Um, uh, sorry, always be analytical about the past and emotional about the future. And that's so true, you know, when you fail, and all of us as leaders fail all the time, you have to fail. Um, if you get stuck in your emotion, you're never going to be able to move forward. Uh, you, you're just going to remain stuck. You have to get your emo emotion out of that um, instance. You have to switch on, look at it um, retrospectively in hindsight, and be very analytical about those learnings. And then reserve your emotion, your passion, to drive and reinvent your next vision. Of, of how you're going to go forward with your life. And I think what I've noticed um, over the years is a lot of people, when they fail, the entire world falls um, to pieces. Uh, we've got to start looking at failure differently. We've got to approach it as a learning curve. You know, the, 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 the more you fail, the quicker you learn, the quicker you can perfect things. Um, so don't, don't get stuck in the emotion there. Rather, save it and invest it into your future. And that was a pearl of wisdom that I, that I really believe in. And Tracy, you you um, now playing your role completely in and phenomenally in leadership development in Africa. But you really went from banking in London to setting up the Starfish Foundation. So what prompted that radical change, and what role did finding your own purpose play in the transition that you've underwent uh, in your career? That's a, that's a, a great question. I, um, I did have a radical change. In fact, I would go so far as to say I had a Damascus Road experience. Um, prior to my banking career in London, I was actually involved in a, in a very, uh, in a, in a, well, a, a, a near tragedy in terms of a car accident. I, at that stage of my life, I was actually involved in acting and television. Um, and had, you know, I was young, so my ego was full at play, and <laughs> I was really wanting to make it big as a soap opera star of all things, and I was going back for my final um, audition for Igoli, and um, I had this huge car accident. Um, I had a near-death experience, um, and just words really fall short when I try and describe this, but my whole life flashed before me. I was definitely departing Earth, that I know for sure. Um, my whole life flashed before me like an amazing fireworks, which fireworks are great and colorful for about 30 seconds. And then there was just this nothingness. Um, and a huge amount of fear around uh, the fear of the unknown, where am I going, what's happening. Everything that was flashing past me was materialism, and I, I couldn't hold on to it. It wasn't coming with me. The, the car, the house, they aren't going with you on the next journey that's out there for all of us. Um, and then I kind of realized that, and then wanted my father to come with me and people with you know what, you're born into this life on your own and you go out alone. And that's the truth of it. And in that moment, I just really cried out. I was like, God, whoever you are, whatever you look like, wherever I'm going, I don't, I'm not ready. I want to go back and I, I want to make a difference and I want to live my life completely differently. And I, 
I want it to have some kind of eternal value and um, and, and meaning, deeper meaning than, than where I was putting my energy. Um, and the long and the short of it is I, I survived that. I had a broken neck, uh, the hangman's fracture. I should have been a quadriplegic or a um, um, paraplegic. I wasn't. Um, I lost my father, the other person that I put you know, that I was very close to literally two weeks later. And it was this radical shift that came to me that, that I really have to figure this life out. Um, it's precious. It's so fragile and we only get one shot at it. But I think I had to. I'm on to my second shot. <laughs> um, well, from there I landed up, of all things, on a trading floor. So maybe I'm just a, it takes me a long time to learn these things. And I did the complete opposite, reinvented myself on a trading floor in London. But the whole time just knew, what am I doing? I've had this unbelievable experience. I know I've got to make a difference in the world. But now I'm back in banking on that trading floor. Um, and, and so I came across a friend of mine um, who was starting a course in London called Adventure of Living. And it just pressed all my buzzwords. Purpose, how do I um, you know, find my mission and my vision for my life? Am I living a purpose-driven life? And all of those kinds of words sort of caught me. So I started doing the course um, around finding out um, where your, your talent intersects with the need of people, where your passion intersects with the need of people, and, and that's where you'll find your purpose. And during that course, I wrote a mission statement for my life. Uh, which is to be um, a voice for the voiceless, to be a bridge between people that have and the people that have not, to always have an ear to hear the cry, a heart to respond to the need, and a voice to verbalize that need out on a global platform and mobilize around that need. And, you know, it's one thing writing these things, but what does that mean? And at that point in time, it was 2000, um, there was this you know, the HIV AIDS pandemic was just sweeping through South Africa and just leaving in its wake just thousands upon thousands of orphan and vulnerable children. And there was an estimated, um, you know, two to three million orphan and vulnerable children by 2010. And this is, you know, 2000. And that really struck a chord with me. Um, and I then went and heard uh, Heather Reynolds speak at a pub in London. She runs God's Golden Acre, which really supports orphan and vulnerable children in the Valley of a Thousand Hills in a very rural community in South Africa. And she told a story around how she came across this um, woman who asked her to go and help a friend of hers who was dead or dying. And she walked through the felt um, at midnight, came to this hut, opened up the door, huge rats ran out, and lying... Um, on the floor was this emaciated woman who was dead. Um, and as she pulled away the blanket, the rats had already eaten away her feet. And she pulled the blanket away some more. And there were just three children just clinging on to their dead mother. And as she pulled these children away, they just started ripping off her blouse, um, a piece of her fabric off her skirt, the button off her blouse. And they were just completely and utterly traumatized. And these children, when she took them and, um, and you know, spent weeks with them, they would, they would never let these little few possessions that they had in their hands go, because that was the only memory they ever had of their mother or their family. And when I heard that story, I was a mess, completely a mess. Um, and I realized I had to do something to help orphan and vulnerable children. That, in a sense, were the people that I felt were voiceless at that particular time in South Africa. Um, and so then I mobilized people across London. We got together. We developed memory bags, um, filled them with Christmas presents to ensure that every child in the Valley of a Thousand Hills uh, received a Christmas present and a memory bag to house the memory of their parents, 750 children at God's Golden Acre. And that was my journey. I've never felt more fulfilled. Um, I was mobilizing people that wanted to make a difference. I was meeting the needs um, of, of, of people um, that were really vulnerable in terms of these young, um, often child-headed households, six years old, looking after their families. Um, and that changed my life forever. And uh, the universe inspired to get me out of Deutsche Bank, uh, go back to South Africa, and play a role in um, founding Starfish in South Africa, um, and, and really creating a social movement. Uh, we just mobilized loads of South Africans, every South African, whether it was people hosting dinner parties, showing the Starfish video, and making a difference for kids, whether it was people running the Comrades, or uh, Marathon, or uh, cycling the Argus, um, to raise funds for these orphan and vulnerable children. It, it really feel, felt like we were able to mobilize not only South Africans, but people around the world to engage in making 
and putting the smiles back on the children's lives in South Africa. So, yeah, that's that's how it all happened. <laughs> Well, what a, a, a real inspiring and purposeful story indeed. And it just underlines, Tracy, that um, if we are emotionally intelligent to embrace our purpose, that um, it, we start living meaningful full lives. Absolutely. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and not everyone has to have a dramatic high accident. In fact, rather just start asking you the, yourself those questions around how can my life ma uh, matter, how can I uh, really live, uh, move from success to significance, how can I live a significant life and I'd love to share a quote with you um, and I'm just going to paraphrase it but it's um, by Frederick Buchner and I think he, he sums it up beautifully, he says, could you live into the intersection where your greatest passion intersects with the need in the world? because that is where true gladness happens. Tracy, and on that note, I would like to thank you for being part of this, for being part of the, the drive behind a purposeful uh, way of living, but also purposeful business and purposeful uh, leadership, especially in Africa. And we are excited and looking forward to um, uh, move on uh, creating an even greater platform where people can get engaged in being proudly for purpose. Thanks so much for taking part. Thank you very much. It's been a real honor. Thank you very much, Tracy. And just a reminder to uh, people who are watching the recording after this uh, session with Tracy, if you have any questions, there's a link below the video uh, which will take you to our forum. Uh, enter your questions there. and. Uh, we will have a team of people and Tracy will probably pop in every now and then and answer the questions on your behalf as well. So Tracy, thank you. Very inspiring story that you've shared with us today. Thank you so much for that. And thank you everybody for joining us today.